In today's episode, Andy and Katie review Ryan Pierce's take on starting a farm. We visit Profound Micro Farms as Jeff Bednar gives us a tour of his deep water system, NFT system, vertical towers, and microgreen setup. We then take a look at how to remove plugs from cell trays, and Andy mixes up some soilless potting mix. What I recommend to people that are interested in doing this, take your time. Um, I think it's really easy to go out and see all the solutions that are out there um, and, and try to rush it and, and try to think that you're going to become an expert grower in a short period of time. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot more money than you think it's going to take. Um, and your chances of success are still going to be very low. Um, there's a lot that goes into businesses like these that you don't see. You don't see all the hardships on the back end. Um, and so know that it's not going to be easy. It's not easier than growing outside. I think a lot of people have that misconception. It's certainly not. There's just a completely different set of challenges that you face. Um, so take your time. Make sure that you've done your research. Make sure that you really understand the financials of the business and you know that there's a market out there for those products where you can meet your financial targets. Um, don't just assume that it, that it exists. Make sure you've done your homework. Make sure you've started to build those relationships before you start to grow anything. If you don't do that, entry point into the market, um, you're going to have to come in with a, with a slightly different value proposition because you're an unknown commodity. Um, and so I think that making sure you've done your homework, do your market research ahead of time, make sure your financials work, and make sure they work on the conservative side. A lot of people lay it out and, and they're, they have financials that just, aren't realistic in, in today's world. Um, so be conservative with your financials. Um, assume that things are going to cost a little bit more. Assume you're going to make a little bit less and then see if your business works. If you, if you end up and you find cost efficiencies and you're able to sell your product for more, that's great. That's just added, added uh, value to the bottom line. And that, that's what you want to, you want to see, but make sure you're conservative when planning those financials and you really understand, um, how you're going to achieve them. I like how Ryan was talking about not rushing things and taking your time. That is a lesson that I learned really late on in our business. Andy already was there. Um, but that when you plan things out specifically and you find those savings, it's a lot better than just reacting to the problem. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can take your production costs and with some simple math, figure out if I buy this in a pallet, or if I do 20 more of those, or, you know, there's, there's certain thresholds that if you meet them, you get a discount that's big enough that it's like, hey, maybe I'm selling for less, but we're doing the volume and it costs me less. So in the, in the long run, we're making more money. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a lot of those things that if you buy retail, you buy locally. Um, I do encourage to buy locally. Try to see if they'll get you a pallet. Some stores just don't do that. We actually stuff. had luck with our local hardware store getting us perlite in the middle of the winter. Like they actually had that availability when all of our, we have a long winter. So all of our greenhouses and supply areas are closed. And so, you know, to find it at a hardware store, you mm -hmm. just have to ask people because you're entering into like the small farm, which in a lot of areas, they're used to serv servicing like the large farm. So there's a lot of things that you've got to factor in there. Like, are you going to have things delivered? Do you have it easily accessible for a truck? Like, because those systems are big and they're going to have to be shipped out of freight. But you have to figure out how much money that's going to save you. Yeah. If, if getting a truck in and out is going to save you having a truck and going down to the freight terminal or even worse, ordering you know, in small amounts for UPS and FedEx, mm -hmm. uh, what's the cost benefit analysis here? Is a little extra driveway or gravel, is that going to be the difference between, you know, $150 a month extra? Mm -hmm. Paying retail and everything mm -hmm. just kills you. I mean, unless you have a market that the, port the prices, you know, will support that, but not everybody does. So, it's always good to streamline things a little bit, if there's room. 
so this is a deep water culture system. Uh, we basically built a, a large pond that's about 32 feet by 32 feet, and uh, it's 18 inches deep. It's a total of 20 with a, a couple inches of room. And what's, what's, the, what's in the pond are these floating rafts. So this is a raft of lettuce. So underneath you can see how the roots are actually just hanging down into the water. And then you can see our heads of uh, oak leaf lettuce up here on the top. So lots of advantages in this type of system inside of a greenhouse. Uh, one is it works like a big conveyor belt. So we harvest off the end here every single week and we'll start seedlings down at the other end every week. So we've got every generation of growth in order to keep the, uh, you know, keep our weekly numbers up. So uh, another advantage of this system is very easy to harvest. So essentially we just reach down, carefully pop the head of lettuce out, and then we'll wrap the roots around the bottom of it and we'll send out a living head of lettuce. So the roots are attached, this will stay alive in someone's refrigerator for three to four weeks at least. And um, we've got several different varieties. Mostly leafy greens are gonna do well in this type of system. So we've got some Swiss chards, some romaine, some oak leaves, uh, some kales, and uh, mustards, arugula, and that sort of thing. Um, one, of the, one of the things we do to this is we actually have air that we pump in there, like fish, uh, they're fish tank air stones. And that's how the roots are gonna get the oxygen. And that also provides a lot of the circulation for the water in here. So there's actually no pumps in here and we use very little electricity. Uh, the only water that we're using are the water that we lose to evaporation and the water that the plants are sucking up out of, the, out of there. So we're able to maintain a very low water usage. So one of the reasons we designed these deep water culture beds is to be very deep. And uh, the reason we made them so deep, 18 inches of water, is so that way we could maintain a very large thermal battery. And in the wintertime, we're going to be able to maintain, it's going to be a lot warmer for a lot longer, uh, and then kind of maintain it overnight. So we're using less propane heat to keep the greenhouse warm. And in the summertime, the same thing as well. A larger body of water is going to stay cooler than a very thin film of water. So in Texas, it gets, we have very, very cold nights in the wintertime and very, very hot summers in the, in the summer. And uh, that makes a big difference for our ability to grow year-round. All right, so this system is called an NFT, which stands for Nutrient Film Technique. And a Nutrient Film Technique, essentially what we have here is a gutter. So these gutters are uh, about two and a half inches deep. And what happens is, is there's water through this little tube that's a constant stream of nutrient-enriched water that flows along the root mass of the plant. So we'll start the, the seedlings in a little plug, pop them into these little holes here, and then they'll grow out. Uh, several advantages and disadvantages of this, start, of this type of system. Uh, one disadvantage is there's a lot of failure points. So there's a lot of little spots that can develop leaks. Um, one thing you can kind of see behind me, we let some plants get pretty big over here. We, do, we use this system a lot for cut and come again crops. We do a lot of edible flowers in NFT. Um, a lot of things that we're going to be harvesting and accessing a lot because uh, it's at waist height. So it actually makes it really convenient to get in there and do our harvesting. Um, we uh, actually are in the process of moving over to a lot shorter channels. In a greenhouse environment in Texas where it's really hot, the longer your channel, the more the water is going to heat up from the time you're putting it in one side going down to the other. Another big thing that we did with this system in particular is we actually plumbed it into our deep water culture system. So we're able to uh, utilize the uh, large thermal mass of that water staying cooler uh, in the summer and warmer in the winter for our NFT system versus having a you know 100 gallon sump or very small sump. Um, uh, we, these systems also are uh, extremely easy to take apart and clean. We can move them around really easy because you essentially none of these channels are really hooked to anything. Um, it's, it was really easy to build this one. We like that. Uh, and it actually will maintain value use. So if we decided to go a different direction, we'd be able to sell the used channels. So the main reason these crops are where they are right now is for ease of harvest. So there's some different plants that um, are a little bit we're going to get to and do cut and come again on. So we've got our... Um, watercress here. So we're going to do a lot of harvesting on this watercress time and time again. And so being that it's at waist height here is really nice. There's also crops that we're going to have in for a really long period of time. So one of those is that pink celery over here. Uh, you can see the Swiss chard behind me. So these have been in for months. And because they've been in there so long, um, one of the things with the raft system, being that it's a styrofoam raft, is that root mass will actually poke and break the rafts because it'll get so big it'll expand. Um, and then there's also a few crops that don't like to have as wet of roots. So they don't always want to be hanging down in the water. And this film of water that goes over the roots 
uh, has them be a lot more successfully grown. Um, and that would be more like the kohlrabis um, and the, um, the different chives, onion chives and garlic chives. So one of, the, uh, one of the biggest things that we do in our NFTs that uh, is more on the other side of the greenhouse, but we do edible flowers. So right now we have around 25 different types of edible flowers that we sell. And edible flowers are something that they only last for a couple of days in the system. So we're going to harvest those quite a bit, and we'll want to be able to have access to them versus bending over in those deep water culture ponds. Uh, you'll also notice in the deep water culture, it's very difficult to get to the middle of the pond. That's one of our most common asked questions. And so we try not to get to the middle. We try to just push everything to the edges. And in an NFT system like this, we're able to get to almost the, the whole part of everything. So we're able to uh, harvest quite, a, quite frequently on it. All right, so this is our uh, seed starting area. So we're, we're going to start all of our seedlings in uh, mostly in rock wool, some in soil, but we start them in these trays. These are set up as flood and drain tables. So there's a sump on the, on the bottom. We're adding very little nutrients to our, our new seedlings. And they're going to be in this system from anywhere from one to three weeks before we transplant them out into a bigger system, one of our towers, our NFTs, or our deep water culture. So we grow right now around 150 different varieties of um, edible flowers, leafy greens, culinary herbs, and almost everything is going to get started in this system before it gets transplanted out to other systems. So this system is, we call it shallow water culture. And in shallow water culture, we're not utilizing the deep water culture depth. We're only growing in about four to six inches of water. So in this system, it's just a tray that fills up with water and it constantly is flowing down to the bottom. We actually call this a waterfall system because we have three trays that successively drop down into the next one, utilizing one pump for three different grow areas. The reason we grow on these trays is because we're able to, once again, be at waist height. So in a greenhouse environment, we're always looking at how closely and how densely can we pack the greenhouse so we can maximize our dollars per square foot. At the same time, how do we save labor cost? because labor is an expensive uh, part of this, and not having to bend over and having easy access to your crops for consistent harvesting makes a big difference for that. So this is a vertical hydroponic system. Uh, once again, there's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one of the things that we love about this system is that we're able to grow crops, uh, specifically like these different types of mint, uh, and maintain and keep them all in their place. So as you guys probably know, mint is an extremely invasive crop. And if we were growing it at this level, we would have to have quite a little bit of outdoor area and have all the different mints separated from each other so they didn't get mixed up. And in these vertical hydroponic systems, we're able to grow orange mint, chocolate mint, lemon mint, um, apple mint, spearmint, double mint, all in their own contained area, but also pretty close to each other and really dense in this greenhouse environment. Um, and essentially what's happening here is that there's these little tubes of water. It's constantly getting a drip of water and then it maintains and goes back to a sump at the end. Once again, conserving water, because the only water we're losing is due to evaporation and, and the plants using it. So it's very water efficient. Uh, one of the downsides is it seems like there's always a leak. So anytime you're doing hydroponics, you're going to expect some leaks. Uh, but this one in particular, uh, you can get the, the towers to move around a little bit. So inside of our greenhouse, we're about 8,000 square feet. You're going to notice that we have an evaporative cooler, cooling wall right over here. It's a swamp cooler, so essentially water is going down through that in the summertime, and as water is flowing through and the fans on the other side of the greenhouse are sucking the air out, it's actually evaporating that water, which creates a cooling effect to help keep our greenhouse cool in the harsh Texas sun. Uh, you'll notice we have lots of circulation fans and different air movement fans around. Keeping the leaves dry is one of the most important parts to having a high-quality crop, so we're going to try and move as much air around here as possible. Uh, we also in the summertime will utilize shade cloth. So right now we haven't put it out because it's early May. In about another three weeks, we're going to put a 55% uh, shade cloth across the entire top of the greenhouse. That'll also help keep our greenhouse about 10 to 15 degrees cooler. Uh, we also, in the wintertime, we're going to use propane air heaters and propane water heaters to keep the, uh, the temperature just right so we can maximize our plant growth year-round for year-round deliveries to restaurants. The holes on the bottom virtually the same. They're roughly the size of an eraser. So when you are planting these, if uh, the, the seedlings are wet, they're going to be hard to pull out. If you let them dry out just slightly before you pull them out to plant them, you can also just take a pencil head or a dribbler or some sort of small mechanism and poke the holes out. But if you can't grab a hold of it and pull it out, it's either not ready to come out 
or the cells are too wet. They're not easy to pinch because it's reinforced plastic, so you're going to need to be able to, to pull them out. Today I'm going to share with you my favorite soil mix. It's actually a soilless mix. There's no soil in this mix. Uh, I do like to add worm castings and compost. This time of year, we're getting into the beginning of January, beginning of 2021. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of compost to spare at the moment. So I'm just going to, this is my soilless mix. I prefer it for trees and shrubs. I use this on tomatoes and peppers as well. Very simple mix. I use uh, three parts perlite, coarse perlite. That's very important. If you can't get the coarse perlite for this mix, it is absolutely a necessity that you sift the finer perlite because you're gonna end up with a lot of dust in that bag and that's gonna throw off this entire mix. This is a very well-drained mix. Oxygen is a really big proponent to root growth and root growth being the most important thing for us in our greenhouse in the north in the winter, root health helps to fight off a lot of diseases and problems systemically in the rest of the plant. Now, the only other ingredient that's a requirement, peat moss, just plain standard peat moss. I get a compressed brick um, for this recipe, two parts peat moss to three parts perlite. I generally, now this isn't an exact measurement, but I'll do one of the 3.4 cubic foot compressed peat moss, the compressed 3.8, excuse me, 3.8 compressed peat moss bale, and then three of the four cubic foot coarse perlite. If you do it with the fine and sift it, you're going to have to mix your mix individually because that's, there's no way for us to know exactly how much of a percentage of that fine perlite is going to be useless dust that actually is going to trap water and, and cause stagnation in your pots. The mix that you end up with is right here. As you can see, I get a lot of people, what's that white stuff? What are those chunks? It's not fertilizer, this is the perlite. Now at this point, I like to do my uh, cuttings, propagation and start seeds. I like to add uh, maybe some fungi, a little bit of compost tea, you get some natural life in there. Other than that, personal preference. You can use a slow release fertilizer. You could stick to all organic. You could be just using guanos. You could do the vegan organic. The, the options are really endless. This mix works really well with a hydroponic solution as well. I flood and drain it. I overwater it. Um, sometimes I bottom water it. It just, it depends on what I'm doing with it. It's a really versatile mix. Holds a lot of water, holds a lot of air. Uh, the only thing I've ever heard folks tell me is, Boy, I have to water this a lot more than your standard peat, or, uh, peat mix from the uh, garden center. Or boy, I have to water this a lot more than a regular, just a standard soil mix. And if you look, uh, those mixes are really designed for ease of growing. They, they don't want maintenance. They don't want you to have to water your plants. If you have to water your plants more, that means your plants are working more. They're drinking more, they're eating more. Um, your soil, you have that capillary action in the soil. And the capillary action in the potting soil, that's what we're trying to mimic from outside, is that capillary action. Water comes in, water comes out. And that's what keeps your roots healthy.